we see China as a nation of apparent strength with very serious weaknesses inside. The speed of the growth has not uh, distributed that wealth evenly through the population. The speed of the growth does not necessarily represent a strength that's built into the country. So you had that concentration of power along the coast because that's where the interaction with the outside world is. It's where the ships come and dock. It's where the product leaves. But that still leaves you with a billion Chinese who are struggling to keep up with the rest of the country. And this is the fundamental problem for the Chinese government. When the Chinese look through history, the risks always come from this rural billion. China is Australia's most important trading partner. It's been in the news recently because of a strong disagreement with the United States over the value of its currency and a spat with Japan over military issues. But the big thing going on in China is preparation for a change in the leadership due to take place next year. Joining me to discuss this is Roger Baker, Stratfor's Vice President of Strategic Intelligence. Roger, China's preparing for a significant change in leadership. Is this taking shape? And if so, what are we seeing? Well, we're already seeing the Chinese preparing for this leadership transition. This is a major issue for uh, the, the government in China and for the Communist Party. Uh, in the past uh, two leadership transitions, the path to succession had already been laid out by Deng Xiaoping. This is the first time that they've really had to choose their own uh, since Deng handed over power uh, decades ago. One of the next steps that we're going to see in this uh, comes up at the uh, meeting of the Central Committee, and that's going to be in early October. And what we expect to see there is finally some shifts in the Central Military Commission. And that's where Xi Jinping is likely to take his role at a higher position uh, and, and affirm his uh, place as the next president of China. We're also keeping a very close eye, though, on who takes the deputy positions and see who gets moved up into these centers of power. There have been signs of increased Chinese assertiveness in recent weeks. Why is that? Well, we've actually uh, seen in recent weeks uh, a greater recognition of what China has been doing for, for maybe a year, a year and a half now. And some of this may be because of the U.S. election coming up, um, because the Indians are becoming much more aware and, and finding better ways to, to push out their concerns of what's going on, uh, and because opportunities have opened up for China to do something that it maybe hasn't done in the past, uh, in particular sending uh, military helicopters into Pakistan. The Chinese military is looking to find ways to follow a green diplomacy path, the same as the United States. Uh, the hospital ship is uh, going to be deployed to be able to respond to uh, disasters, natural disasters and the like. These helicopter deployments were in the past the Chinese would do it through civilian or, or non-military government means. They're now doing it through the PLA uh, to get the face of the PLA out there, to demonstrate to the region uh, that the PLA is cooperative, that it's okay to see the PLA around you, and that uh, reduces in some sense the reliance of other countries on the United States to always come in and help in a disaster. Um, it also softens the, the perception of threat if China does start becoming more active uh, physically within the general region. Is this in any sense an appeal to nationalism? There is some of that going on. Uh, as, we, as the Chinese continue to struggle with their internal economic problems, as the Chinese uh, have to uh, deal with some of the crises that, that flare up in the region, um, and ultimately as they look towards uh, their, their big concern is that the United States is, is going to be free from uh, Afghanistan, free from Iraq sometime in the next few years, and the natural place for the U.S. to turn is against the Chinese. And so they can use this sense of nationalism both to uh, rally the forces at home, uh, rally the population and try to maintain that sense of unity when they're dealing with sensitive economic issues, when they're dealing with the political transition in China. Uh, they can also use it to try to give a sense of um, maybe caution to countries outside not to egg the Chinese on uh, so that they don't get caught in the middle of a, a kind of growing uh, trouble between China and the United States. I suppose what we're seeing is China just trying to punch its weight at the appropriate level nowadays. The, the Chinese have certainly been on a program to add a military dimension to what formerly was primarily an economic 
uh, role. They position themselves as as an economic player internationally. They're they're now you know by by at least quarterly figures they're the second largest economy in the world. They, they feel that they should have a role that that matches that. So economically, they've taken a bigger role, particularly with the economic crisis, and and played themselves up as something more significant. Politically, they've become more active, uh, further away from Beijing, uh, and they're adding that military element in there. Uh, that secures supply lines, that gives them a way to, to showcase, uh, I guess, what could go back to uh, what they used to call the peaceful rise of China. Where do we see China's economy headed? There are people out there who are very gung-ho about China, but others who tinge their optimism with a good deal of caution. We continue to be cautious on the Chinese economy. There are still some very serious structural problems uh, within it. I know the Chinese are putting out figures that suggest, for example, that, that urbanization is now nearly equal to uh, the rural population, that their uh, dependence upon exports as a percent of GDP is shrinking. But, it, but if you look at these, one, it's not necessarily uh, a guarantee that just because the Chinese are now in what they call an urban area and they've really reduced the the requirement to call it urban, um, that if they're in an urban area, they're going to suddenly be consumptive. And this was the concept of urbanization, to have greater consumption uh, inside the Chinese economy. And then when you look at the Chinese economic figures, even though there's a lower percent uh, coming in from exports, there's a much higher percent coming in from government stimulus uh, monies. And so while the Chinese have lost some of their export market because of the general global slowdown, they've had to supplement even more with government spending and government programs. And that's going to be very hard to sustain without a steady inflow of foreign money coming in to keep building them back up. The, the Chinese are recognizing that they're, they're, and they have recognized already, that they're really at a, at a turning point in their economy, that they have to alter the structure of their economy. And their big fear is that altering the structure of the economy will unbalance the social situation. And in unbalancing that, that leads to a crisis uh, that, that could end up being a political crisis as well. And so while they know that they need to change, they fear uh, their capability of changing. Yes, and I've even heard the Chinese Premier Wen Xiaobo express some doubts about the economy. Well, Wen is an interesting figure because he really is the, the, the avuncular leader in China. Everyone looks to him as, as this is when he understands us, he understands the people, he understands the, the lower level people. And sometimes the government will deploy him to take on the same issues that the general population is grumbling about. So he raises housing issues. He talks about uh, distribution of wealth and things of that sort. He talks about corruption. He talks about the things that the average man uh, wants to hear his government talk about and say, I understand you, I, I feel for you. When Wen says it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be policy. Uh, it, it really, when it comes from Hu Jintao, then you know it's going to be policy. So Wen also this past time made some comments about the need for political reform. This idea that, that economic reform couldn't occur without another step of political reform, another change in politics. Uh, I think some people see this as, a, as a, maybe a challenge to the current regime. I, I think it's less a challenge and more uh, trying to appeal to the interests of the average Chinese and keep them uh, less likely to complain because they say, oh, well, Wen Jibao knows this, and he's working on it, so we'll give him a little space. I referred to earlier disagreements with the United States. Is it likely that these disagreements will grow stronger and there could be some major clash between the Americans and the Chinese? In the short term, we don't necessarily see a major confrontation. Both the Chinese government and the United States government have very strong reasons not to allow the relationship to deteriorate substantially. At the same time, as we've noted with China with nationalism, with the US with elections and the economic system, both governments have a reason to at least uh, rhetorically play up differences and, and make a very visible show of those differences to try to appeal to their own uh, constituents, to their own populations. So you see this uh, building towards the, the challenge to the Yuan again. At the same time, you see the reinstitution of U.S. and Chinese military dialogue and exchanges. So they're managing the relationship while being able to play at a certain level the differences. In the long run, however, uh, as you go out several years, China is really one of, the, one of the few countries out there that has the potential to challenge fundamental U.S. interests. 
and, and that in particular is in the Asia Pacific region, that's in, in access to seas, that's in, in market and in and alliance structures. And so while it may not be inevitable that they are heading towards a confrontation, I think that the general relationship between the United States barring a, a early collapse of the Chinese economy or a sudden shift in the political system in China, uh, that, that this relationship is heading towards um, uh, more troubled waters down the road. Roger, thank you. Roger Baker there. He's Stratfor's Vice President for Strategic Intelligence. I'm Colin Chapman at Stratfor. Bye for now.